Good morning. Good morning. And how about those Tigers? How about those Detroit Tigers? Huh? Yeah. Ten years since a postseason ex experience. Uh, so they are in the postseason, so they could take it all. They could take it all. Huh? I don't see any heads nodding. They could yes, take they it could. all, right? Yes. Go, those, go Tigers. All right. Of course, Dodgers are doing pretty well, too. Go Dodgers. <laughs> so anyway, uh, today is Mission Sunday, so we have our mm. missions treasure chest open, and this is for local uh, community kinds of support, individuals, families, organizations, places where we see the good news of Jesus leading the way, and we want to support that. So uh, Mission Sunday, and if you didn't bring your checkbook or gold bullion with you this Sunday, then uh, next Sunday, too, will be a Mission Sunday. So that's for third quarter, and then fourth quarter we'll be looking at something international. Uh, of course, we do the shoe boxes, right? It's shoe box right. time, oh and I don't know if you noticed, but coming into the foyer, there is uh, there are some shoe box materials for you. Take a shoe box home. It's 10 bucks. Put a check in there, and it goes to a needy child somewhere around the planet. Might even be here in the United States, so uh, you just never know. There are ways of tracking it, but you have to register online with, at SamaritansPurse.org. You have to register with them, and then they send you back an email. Somehow they track your shoe box out of the millions that go out. But anyway, it's shoe box time, and that's an exciting time. International kinds of missions, reaching out to people all over the planet with the good news of Jesus. Other things, uh, we've got uh, newsletters are out for October. It is almost October. So uh, you can either look online, and if you want to receive a free newsletter online once a month, uh, just let us know. Send your email in and say, hey, send me a newsletter. You can be part of 100 and, I don't know, we've got about 145 people on our email newsletter list. So you can be part of that crowd. Uh, otherwise, there are hard, hard copies out there in the foyer also. Next week is potluck, so bring a dish to pass. Bring your gourmet dishes and, or desserts or salads or whatever, and we'll have a good time after service. It's also communion. You guys on uh, Facebook and YouTube, well, Facebook, you can join us live for communion. Have your bread and your wine or grape juice or whatever ready to remember Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us 2,000 years ago, a sacrifice that points towards the heart of God in all the things that we do. So Communion Sunday, next Sunday also. Other things, anything else, Sue? That I think that's it. Well, prayer and praise. Prayer and praise, October 25th. Oh, prayer and praise, yes. October 25th, set your calendar. Um, that's prayer and praise right here. It's a community prayer and praise. We've got some participation from other churches on the island, which is exciting. And so uh, we're planning on that. And then the week before, the Friday before that, October 18th, we've got a soup supper at the Buxton's house. And we know at the Buxton's, they throw a party <laughs> like nobody's business. So, so we'll see how that goes. So that's October 18th, 6 o'clock, soup supper. And all that is in your newsletter, and you can also catch it online uh, on our uh, website, www.lighthousechurchdrummondisland.com. You can catch all that and more to encourage you in your spiritual walk. Let's pray. We're going to be tackling a tough subject today, so extra intensive prayer this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are with us through thick and through thin. We thank you that your spirit never leaves us or forsakes us or leaves us as orphans. But you are always there to scoop us up, to lead us, guide us, support us, strengthen us in so many different ways. Help us become more aware of your presence, especially when we go through hard times, that we may be able to sense your presence, leading, guiding, and supporting all the way. And we love you. Open our hearts this morning to receive the message through music, through worship, through message, through all the different ways. Help us to 
have our hearts and minds open to your Holy Spirit this morning for this specific word, this specific message you need us to hear this morning. In the wonderful, faithful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 God is faithful. Let's sing about that. To the Lord our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, <clears throat> sing praise. His mighty hand and His outstretched arm, His love endures forever. That's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. Blessed be your name in the land, 
that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Shining down on me when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I thought it was me. <laughs> yeah, that's really low. There we go. There we go. Of the good 
Ruth, would you say a prayer for us this morning? Gosh, you always get me at this point. <laughs> Lord, it seems like I live on the verge of tears, tears of sadness and tears of gladness, Father. But I praise you every day, Lord. And I thank you for this beautiful, beautiful planet you've given us, this beautiful country, Lord, and more specifically, the state and this gorgeous island. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the colors that are turning all over the place. Thank you, Lord. It's so happy. It just makes my heart sing, Lord. And it's a pleasure for me, for me Lord, and an honor to sing with this group to thank these you. people. And I just thank you, Lord, for my voice. Thank you. And I thank you for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Daryl Van Tongren is a professor of psychology at Hope College in Holland, Michigan, one of our own, has just written a book, one of many books uh, that he's written, but a book on why people are leaving the church, on why people are leaving the church. And there are scads of books about that, but this just came out this last summer, just a couple of months ago. And he claims that he has used the most recent and up-to-date research on why people leave church. And so Professor Tongren says that there are four main reasons from his data that people leave church. And those reasons basically are tied together through uh, kind of the notion that basically people's life experiences do not match up with what they've been taught in church. The belief system that's been taught to them, wherever they are, does not match up with what they're actually experiencing in life. And so he gives those four reasons, and they go into those things. But I want to read reason number three to you this morning. It's in an article that he wrote, basically kind of highlighting his book. Reason number three goes into what we're going to be talking about this morning. He says in the article, he says, number three, some walk away from their faith because of suffering. Many have been given, quote unquote, theologically thin accounts for the existence of evil in the world or insufficient explanation for why adversity strikes. They cannot make sense of what they were taught and their life experiences especially if their previous beliefs were framed in a just world belief system, which teaches that people get basically what they deserve. After all, if life is fair, if something bad happens to me, does that mean that I'm bad and deserved it? Simplistic views of suffering can lead people to leave religion. So that's what I'd like to tackle this morning. I'd like to take a look at what is a realistic understanding and a grasp of how Jesus helps us through or is present for us in times of suffering, in times of tragedy, in times when we're facing life and death, when, when all sorts of calamity is staring us in the face, whether it happens or not, our body responds, our emotions respond, our spirit responds, and things go one way or another. But I'd like to take an honest look at that. And Greg's going to be talking about this also next week, about a way to look at the difficulties in our life when we're up against obstacles that just seem crazy, and it seems like we're done for. We're going to be looking at how is God involved in that and what is God leading us or in inviting us into? What kind of experience are we being invited into? We're going to take a look at that this morning. So I, I welcome your responses. We do our response time 
afterwards, and I welcome your responses or questions or criticisms or whatever, places that you would cover. Uh, you guys, too, on Facebook, welcome your kind of critical review of all this. Because what we're trying to arrive at is a realistic, a real-life kind of understanding of where is Jesus in the midst of all of this. So two tales of tragedy. Two tales of tragedy for you to kind of kick us off. Two stories. The first story happens back in 1989, and I am waiting at about 9 o'clock in the evening at a hospital in Monterey, California. And I haven't had anything to eat all day, and I'm just kind of sipping some coffee, just stunned. Because my first wife is lying in, in a hospital bed, and she is between death and life. And very likely, this is the last night of her earthly life. And I'm just sitting there, and nobody else is there. It's in the evening. Nobody else is in the hospital cafeteria. I'm sipping my coffee, and I'm caught between two worlds. On the one hand, I'm scared to death that she will die, right? I'm scared to death that she will die. On the other hand, I'm scared to death that she will live, that she will live an impaired, substantially crummy life with all sorts of physical kinds of disabilities and very low quality. And so I'm caught between those two tensions and just kind of sitting there in this kind of semi-dark cafeteria space when most things are closed down, sipping my cup of coffee. When all of a sudden, David Jones shows up you don't know David Jones, but he was our acolyte master. Uh, he was our youth group leader. He was, this is small church experience. This is about um, a fourth of the size of our church. Okay, I mean, just, and not a lot of people. But David Jones took on all these different ministries and all this. And he comes walking in with a sack of McDonald's hamburgers and sits down and we talk. He was the presence of God for me that evening. And Barb did pass away early in the morning. But he was that angel of light. He was that presence of God's love. He was that interjection. It was, it was just so surprising that he would come walking in. But maybe not. David Jones was that, that strength that I needed to get through that night and through the morning. And God would intervene in other ways, too. I would be amazed at the ways in which God would find intersection points for me with other grieving people, with, with people who would be support to me or I could be support to them. Even in my brokenness and, and my first experience of kind of depression that lasted more than an evening, um, God would use and come to me in so many surprising ways. And he began to learn about grace at a real deeper, much deeper level. The second tale of tragedy comes from the Bible. The Bible is full of different tragic tales, and I love the way that the Bible doesn't pull any punches, Old Testament or new, that, that we get all of the human kinds of stuff going on, as well as where is Jesus in the middle of all this? And so to read that passage for us, ask Viv to come up this morning and read from Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35. Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35. The very end of that chapter, Mark chapter 4. Read along with us. Let's give her a hand. Give her some encouragement. Yay! Oh, let's get the microphone. The microphone isn't give her yours because the microphone's on the speaker. Oh, okay. Is that gonna work? Let's see, you put that on your hold it. Yeah, I mean 
Actually, let's give him John. Crank her up. Can I just read out loud? And yeah, 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 just project. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over the other side. That's Jesus talking. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And the other little boats were also with him. <clears throat> and a great storm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked to the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said unto one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Thank you, Biff. All right. So, our basic human fear is don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care that we're dying? We're going down here. And, and oftentimes when we go through tragedies, we feel isolated and alone. And the disciples characterize that so perfectly. Don't you care? Don't you care? And we feel like nobody in the world cares. God, our friends, our family, we feel utterly alone and isolated. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And he stills the waves. And he stills the storm. And there's something about the presence of God. There's something about the way that Jesus is there for us that can bring that peace inside. And it's not the storm that's on the outside, it's the storm that's on the inside. Because we're struggling with, oh, I'm not going to be able to be connected. I won't be able to resolve this. I won't be able to solve this problem that's in front of me. There seems to be no way around it. I, I, the walls are too high. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Let's start with you. Let's start with you on the inside. And what God is inviting us to is to trust a larger reality. Because what we do when we meet up against something that's life and death, what we do is we tend to reduce our reality down to very small options. We see our survival skills come into play and we think, okay, what are my routes of escape? What are the places where I can fight? What are the places where I can win or not win? And we're, strat we're just calculating. And this is all happening so quickly. But it's a tiny, small, little window. And God says, there's a lot more going on than what you think. And the invitation is to trust the larger view that there's a lot more going on. And it's a courageous kind of step on our part to be able to say, okay, God, I don't see it at this point, but I'm open. I'm open to a larger view, to be able to see things from a larger perspective. And I invite you to help me with that, to be able to see that. Open my eyes that I might see. 
Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your strength and lean not on your what? Your own understanding. And the idea is, is that we tend to fall back upon our own experience, whether we were successful or not successful, against tragedies in life. And we just fall back upon our own limited experience. And God says, no, 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 there's a bigger perspective going on. And God says to us, if we're open to it, Jesus says to us, I've always been with you. I will never forsake you. And we oftentimes think that our emotional acting out, which we usually do, uh, our emotional acting out when we're up against the wall and we're going crazy and doing our tantrum stuff, that we think that, well, we're disqualified for God's help. That there's something deep inside of us that says, I'm not qualified. I'm not worthy. I have not acted faithfully. I'm such an idiot. And Jesus goes, no, 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 no. And the first perspective is that God is with us through everything that we do. Whether you're feeling that, experiencing that or not, that's the reality. And Jesus goes through that experience with us. If the cross teaches us anything, it's about God as a co-sufferer with us takes our brokenness, takes our sinfulness, takes our messed upness into himself, absorbs that, shares that, and understands that. And just like the first song that we sang, God is faithful. His love endures forever. God never breaks the connection. That's so important. The second thing is, is that God invites us, never commands us or makes us or beats us over the head, but God is continually inviting us into that larger perspective. That there's more going on in our suffering than we realize. There's stuff that is happening and actually some really interesting and potentially amazing kinds of things happening even in the midst of our suffering. And it doesn't mean that God causes it or God wants us to suffer or anything like that, but that God is faithful to move through every circumstance of our life, up, down, sideways, doesn't matter. God is there moving and transforming. And there's always a potential for something amazing to happen. Our tendency, though, is to take our focus off of Jesus, right? Take our focus off of Jesus and, and, and to, like Peter, start to sink into the, into the water. Help me, Lord. So a couple things just to remember when you're going through really stretching experiences and keeping in mind this backdrop of the faithfulness of God and that God is constantly working for our good, trying to pop up, that we have David Joneses in our lives that will pop up out of places, whether they be family or friends or even perfect strangers who will give us a call, a note, a meal, um, some sign that there's some goodness there. The goodness of God exists for us. Three things to remember when you're sailing stormy seas, just like the disciples. One is to resist trying to recover the past. That's oftentimes what we try to do. We experience loss. We experience something going on in our life, and we're changed. You can't go back, but we try to. We try to. We try to find stability points in our lives. When we think life was happy, life was good, Life was stable, you know? And we try to go back to those places. And that's natural, that's human. But again, God's invitation is to say, let's move on. You're changed. You will never be the same again. You're changed by tragedies, as well as joys and other deep kinds of experiences. We're changed. We're changed people. And to say, okay, well, what does this mean? What are these changes all about? 
and to allow God to lead us into the future rather than back into the past. Beware of trying to stick back in the past. It's natural to try to do that. Just be aware of it and allow the Holy Spirit of God to lead you into something new. You are a changed individual. Remember that God is tucking you in a certain sense. God tucks you into his heart. I I think about Galatians 2.20. I crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not Christ who, not, not me, but Christ in me. And, and it's just that we have died, died to ourselves, that our commitment to God involves a death to that, that ego that wants to control and try to manipulate our reality all around us. And even though we do that as human beings, and again, we'll do that until we die, um, we try to get better at this, but, but even though we try to control and manipulate stuff, the goal is, is to release and to allow God's hand to take our hand and lead us on a new pathway. So we surrender to God's goodness, the idea of trusting God's process in our lives. And this is, this is the hard part, especially when it looks stormy and awful and dark skies and lightning flashing all around. And we go, I'm sorry, I want to go that way. And Jesus goes, no, we'll make it, we'll get through this. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. For you are with me. And so... The idea of God's goodness, of trusting that God is actually good, that means that God works towards your good and the good of all those around you. That God isn't a mean judge or somebody who's going to condemn you or try to trip you up or try to mess you, mess with you and and coerce you and do all sorts of things. That's, That's from the other side. That God's goodness is always inviting you into that place of support and trust. And it's really, really, really hard to do that when you feel all your agency, all your choice making seems to go down the drain. It seems like you're stuck. It seems like you're caught between a rock and a hard place. It's hard to trust in those places. But that's the invitation. And oftentimes it takes God's surprises his reminders, Jesus' little surprises in our lives that will wake us up, a butterfly flying here, something that distracts us out of our cloudy zone. Don't you care that we're going to die? Take something to distract us, a sunset, a friend dropping by, a barking dog, I don't know, whatever it is. But God sends those messages to try to pull our focus back to that goodness that he is. And then the third thing is to allow others the privilege of carrying your heartache. This is tough. We are Americans. We are Drummond Islanders. We are pioneers. By golly, we will carry our own burdens. We will carry our own loads. Um, and I don't need anybody's help. And that is deeper, that's a deeper core value than we realize. And for us to say, help me, please, I need your help. It's so hard. But it's allowing someone else to carry that heartache, to carry that burden, and to share that burden with us. And you know what? God uses that as as a way to minister to that other person. It allows them to open up more to the goodness of God, to the agency of Jesus Christ in their lives, to allow others to carry that burden, or allow Jesus himself to be that co-sufferer in our lives and to carry that burden, to involve other people. That's what the church is for That's what community is for. That's what humanity is for. 
to allow us to carry one another's burdens. Jesus was full of joy. He had the joy of of the Holy Spirit in his lives, yet he was a man of sorrows, Isaiah 53 says. He was a man of sorrows. Why? Because he carried. He carried the brokenness of people in his life. Every day, every breath that he took, he could feel it deep inside. But he carried that joy also. He knew the goodness of his Father. And to carry carry that good news to others. There's a bigger perspective, folks. That's what the kingdom of God is about. Our little kingdom is a tiny little square. We think it's really expansive, but it's a tiny little square. God's kingdom is something so expansive and so large. Um, It's like the sky. It's like the stars. It's like the universe. It's bigger than the universe. And God invites us into a new perspective, a new way of appreciating life. Some of you are going through some tough stuff. Some of you know others who are going through really tough stuff. And God never takes away from our pain. God never tries to erase it. Jesus doesn't try to just step over it. Jesus walks right through it. He understands. And God wants to do the same thing for us today. To help us experience that goodness, the larger perspective, the wider viewpoint that God has in all of that. And that there remains for us a place of rest. There remains for us a place of peace. There remains for us a a new kind of experience other than our suffering. But God invites us to stay with the pain, not to just kind of toss it off or run away from it. There's an Episcopal priest by the name of Adam Bucko, interesting name, Adam Bucko, Episcopal priest, who's written on, uh, uh, also written a book recently, and it's about suffering. But he takes a different perspective He wrote a book called Letting Heartbreak Be Your Guide. A little strange. Letting Heartbreak Be Your Guide. And Adam Bucko talks about the idea of holding on to that tension, that brokenness, that suffering. Actually holding on to it in a certain sense and not leaving it too quickly. And he says, when we hold on to our heartbreak, this is from his book, when we hold on to our heartbreak and our aliveness, when we really meditate on it, when we hold these questions with every cell of our being, something cracks and there's this sense that arises in us. And I call that the Holy Spirit, the impulse of God. Goes on to talk about that when we hold on to that and allow God to be with us in that pain, just like Mary did, remember? She held on to some really distressing stuff in her, the prophecies about Jesus from Simeon. And a sword will pierce your heart also. And it happened right in that instant. And she held on to that distress. A mother losing, she knew she was going to lose her only son. He says something happens, something cracks. There's a a a kind of resilience that builds in us, quite unexpectedly, quite unconsciously. And he says this, he says, resilience is really about the life of God flowing into us and remaking us, renewing us, transforming us, and transfiguring all the broken pieces of our lives into something that is whole, something that reflects God. This is a radical notion to hold on to that suffering, to hold on to that pain, and let God work with the cracks, the brokenness in us. Remember the Japanese art form, Kintsugi? 
It's where you have a, a precious plate or a bowl that's been broken into pieces. And in Japan, they will, they will put those pieces back together, but the glue will be gold, some sort of gold, that they will glue the pieces back together, and you can see all the broken spots, but they're gold. They're golden. You can look this up, kintsugi. And that's what God does with us, is we become more beautiful after that period of suffering. And we have no way of seeing that, and we have no way of understanding that, and we certainly have no way of engineering it on our own. But somehow, God mends us together with the gold that is of His Holy Spirit. And if you're open to it, if you're willing to trust the goodness of God and the largeness of God's vision for your life, there will be something extra special that emerges in your life. And it will be pure gift. A pure gift. Where is Jesus when we encounter tragedies? Right there. And our, our response is, don't you care? Don't you care? What is wrong with you? Why don't you fix this? Why don't you resolve this? Right now, we're on the clock. Let's go. And Jesus doesn't work the way that we want him to work. But he will work in a way that is good and faithful. Watch for him. In the David Joneses and the visitations of your life, in the little cracks and fissures that make up your life at that moment, what's coming through those cracks? Is it a friend, a family member? Where are those places of support? That is the absolute essence of the living God for you. Amen. We're going to sing a song now. It's called The Lighthouse. I'd like you to think about the lighthouse drawing you, drawing you, beckoning you to refocus to gain a new perspective and to be called into a new reality. When darkness falls all around, when the waves rise up against my soul, straining just to see.
Thank you, Jesus. Help us to have our hearts open to your strength, your vision, your guidance in everything that we do, especially in the hard times. And we bless you for being that lighthouse. Help us to pay attention. Keep us off the rocks. Keep us there in the stormy seas that we may keep our eyes fixed upon you in your name we pray, amen. Hey guys, Facebook, thank you for joining us this morning. I pray that there was a word or something that spoke to your hearts, especially you who are going through something which is really, really hard right now. And if you know of somebody who's going through something hard, please feel free to send this, this uh, post, uh, this Facebook post, to them to encourage their hearts because these are tough times, they're rough seas, and we need all the encouragement that we can get. So thanks for supporting us. Thanks for your prayers and financial support. Don't forget that next Sunday is Communion Sunday. And if you're on the island, come join us. 
But otherwise, join us online, and we pray that God will continue to open our eyes in thick or thin this week. God bless you. Have a great week.